Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Renusha, and I am the moderator for this session. This is an educational public forum organized in collaboration of Tun Hussein on National Eye Specialist Hospital and DKSH. Tone is a private eye hospital providing quality eye care services for more than 30 years. Uh, it's located in the heart of Petaling Jaya. They offer services in professional and caring environment, emphasizing concern and commitment to their patient. As we know, eyesight is one of the most important senses. 80% of what we perceive come true from our sense of sight. By protecting our eye, we we'll reduce the oath of blindness and visual loss, also while, stay, while staying on the top of developing eye diseases. In this session, we will be discussing on two interesting topics, recent advances in cataract surgery and glaucoma, the silent thief of sight. A kind reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to type in at the comment section below. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Chong Yin Yao, consultant ophthalmologist and cornea and refractive surgeon to speak on the topic Reason advances in cataract surgery. Over to you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, educational health talk, joint organized by the Tun Hussein National Eye Hospital and DKSH. Uh, I'm Dr. Chung, and I am uh, a cornea and refractive surgeon, works in uh, this uh, Tun Hussein. So today, I would like to share with you a topic on. Uh, advances in cataract surgery, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to share my slide with you now. Okay, can you all see my slide? Can I have a feedback? Can you, can you all see my slide? Hello? Hello, can you see my slide? I can't hear any sound from the other side. Anybody? Hello. I can't hear anything. Hi, Dr. Want... Yes, we can see. We can see your slide. Yeah, yeah very good. Okay. All right. That's good. Now, um, I'm, I'm sure most uh, people know what is cataract. However, still, there are many people thought that cataract is a skin or a layer of tissue that grows over the eye, something like this, okay? So, you know, when they see this layer of tissue grow on the surface skin, they think, and they thought that this is called, this is cataract. In actual fact, this is not cataract. So what is cataract? Cataract is actually the coating of a part of the eye called the lens. So you have to know where is the lens. Now in the front part of the eye, there's a layer of transparent tissue called cornea. Okay, cornea. That's the most front part of the eye. Then behind the cornea, you can see around dark circle here is a pupil. And behind the pupil, if you can see my cursor, that is where the lens is. Okay, so it is not in front of the eye, but actually it's inside the eye. So actually in a normal uh, you know, even in the elderly person eye, like this actually is an elderly, you can see there's a pigmentation on the surface. With this kind of pupil, with your naked eye, you will not be able to tell whether the patient has cataract or not, okay? Unless the patient has a very mature cataract, okay? A mature cataract means when you look at the eye, you actually can see this white reflex from the pupil, okay? So it's like a layer of a piece of uh, this uh, tissue paper that you place in front of your eye. So in this particular eye, this patient will not be able to see your fingers, your face or anything in front of them. They can only appreciate maybe light or some shadow movement. Okay. Now, most people will have this type of cataract called a, a moderate cataract to begin with because uh, <clears throat> this is where it started to affect their vision, okay? So with this type of cataract, unless we are checking the eye with a, 
uh, equipments or instrument with a good lighting and high magnification with a dilated pupil. Most of the time, uh, with naked eye, you won't be able to tell whether a patient has a cataract or not. Okay, right. <clears throat> so what's the causes of a cataract? And in most cases, cataract is actually the result of degenerative changes of the lens. That means it's an aging process. So that means the normal aging process, just like, you know, when you get older, you will have, say, more and more wrinkles, more and more white hairs, or you start losing hair. So it's something that's unavoidable. Yeah? From the age of 40 plus and usually 50 and above, most people will start to have uh, some sort of or some form of cataract. Okay? Of course, uh, the older you become, the, the cataract will become uh, more and more mature and the vision will get poorer and poorer. So besides the aging pop uh, uh, issue, uh, there are other issue uh, uh, reasons such as injury. For instance, in this uh, picture, it shows a, a penetrating injury. That means this eye has a sharp uh, material that poke into the eye, cause damage to the cornea. As you can see here, there's some stitches here. And these uh, you know, foreign object actually pierce through into the lens and cause damage to the lens and thus the lens turn from clear to cloudy, okay? The other uh, more common causes are like diabetes. Huh? Diabetes can affect a, pe a person from head to toe. So uh, early cataract formation is also one of the uh, issues related to diabetes. Medications such as steroids, okay? They will form some kind of cataract uh, at the back part of the lens, like something like this. And uh, this is especially for those who take uh, oral steroid for say, you know, uh, skin allergic skin condition or some autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or SLE. Uh, with long uh, term steroid medication, uh, they tend to develop early cataract as well compared to uh, normal population. So what are the symptoms? Obviously, if the lens become cloudy, the, the, the first problem that uh, 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 caused the, the patient to aware uh, the eye may not be uh, normal is blur vision. Okay? Now, blur vision here, we are talking about uh, patient cannot see uh, distant as well as the near images. Now, if you find that you can actually see the far well, but near not well, or you can see near well, but far not well, then most likely it's because of power issue, okay? It's either long-sightedness or short-sightedness or uh, aging problem that they can't, you can't see near. So in, 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 in this type of scenario, likely that, you know, you go to optical shop, they'll probably get able to get you a pair of glasses and that will help you to improve your vision. If glasses is unable to improve your vision, whether it's near vision and far vision, then that means there may be some problem with your eyes, you should see it eye doctor to check it out, okay? Change of color visions is another symptom that experienced by uh, a patient with cataract. They will find that, uh, you know, the color become dustier. They are not, the color not so bril brilliant anymore. And then uh, excessive glare, you know, there will be patient uh, complain that if they go under the hot sun, they'll find very glaring compared to uh, earlier times. Or those who drive at night, if they, uh, they get, they feel that their eye get blinded if there's oncoming car light shining at them. These are also early signs of cat, uh, early symptoms of uh, cataract. Some patients will complain of double vision. In fact, double vision to them actually, if if I lead them, guide them, then actually it's more of like shadow they see from uh, their vision. Okay, they see shadow. Okay, and in some patient, <clears throat> uh, there is increases in the spectacle power. Uh, this is uh, this happened especially in some of these uh, uh, you know patients who have early cataract. Initially, they may find that hey, initially they actually cannot see near very well. They need reading glasses. Then, when they start developing the cataract at the early stage, that actually makes the eye a little bit more short-sighted. So they can actually see near quite well without glasses. So to some of these patients. They are very happy. They thought they oh they eye be, they become younger now because you know initially they need to wear reading glasses to see near, but now they can see near well without glasses. 
But actually, what actually they are missing out is that far vision, they probably can't see very well because of these uh, short-sighted changes. Uh, usually, these, these uh, honey, honeymoon times usually last about six months to a year. Then they will find that, eh, near again, slowly become uh, not able to see again, no far uh, vision. So at that time, they will notice that they'll find that a far and near, they also cannot see very well. So these are some of the symptoms of cataract. So what are the treatment for cataract? Now the bad news is there's no eye drops that they can apply or there's no medication or tablets or capsule that they can take to clear the cataract. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is there's actually very effective surgical treatment to clear the cataract to improve the vision. Okay, this is the only procedure uh, that uh, require to manage a uh, uh, cataract problem. Okay, now the cataract surgery involves removal of the opaque lens or the cloudy lens surgically and lens because it's removed already so there will be a replacement with a clear artificial lens like this shown here in this bottom picture now a brief history of cataract surgery this uh, go back to many many years ago before century 600 before century it was a very crude method it's called couching where a sharp instrument is plunged into the eye pointed into the whitish opacity and push down to dislodge the cataract. So it's a very barbaric kind of surgical procedure. A number of patients will be blinded from this procedure because of infection. Okay. Then from the 18th century to 19th to the 70s, you know, this is just about 50 years ago. Uh, cataract was removed with a procedure called intracapsular cataract extraction or ICCE. Okay. So this in this procedure, the entire lens is removed. And most of the time, there is no artificial lens replaced. So previously, you know, uh, if you can, some of the patient may be able, the audience here may recall, you know, their grandfather, grandparents who had cataract surgery done many years ago. After the surgery, they need to wear very, very thick glasses in order to see, okay? So since the 60 until now, even now, we have this procedure called extra capsule cataract extraction. Sometimes we do do this, we call O method or surgical method in general right now uh, uh, to remove the cataract. And with this procedure, we also put in a lens for patient to see. I will tell you the difference between what we do now for ECCE and the latest technology, which is called a FACO emulsification or in short FACO, okay? So this actually started, uh, we started to perform this kind of procedure in the 70s until now. Now, so uh, briefly, this is how uh, ECCE looks like. We have to make a very large wound in order to remove the lens, as you can see here. And up, because the wound is so big, after the surgery, we have to put on some stitches to close up the wound, okay? Now, because that's big wound, so uh, the surgery has been done uh, usually under local anesthesia, that means some kind of injection or general anesthesia. Uh, um, uh, because of a large wound, the healing is slower, the predictability is uh, not so good, and then uh, the chances of having complication is uh, definitely higher with this uh, surgical so-called uh, older method that still practicing uh, on selective cases at times. However, majority and most of the cases, we are the surgery is performed with a technique called phaco emulsification, or we call it also a small incision cataract surgery. This is currently the most advanced technique in cataract surgery and the most mature way of performing cataract surgery. Okay, now in this procedure, what actually we do is we use an ultrasound instrument, okay, like shown here, to melt down or emulsify the lens and then we aspirate the lens through a small incision now because of this uh, surgery can be performed with a small incision like this huh? you see this incision is so small as compared it's usually range from 2.2 to 2.75 uh, 
as compared to large incision about 8 to 12 millimeters. So this is a big difference in terms of the wound. Now with this, uh, this, uh, this newer, uh, this uh, current uh, technology actually is a very mature technology. It's highly depending on the skill of the trained surgeon as well as uh, good equipments. Uh, these uh, good equipments that that is available nowadays make the surgery safer and much more predictable. And the result is also very predictable. Uh, uh, with this technology, the because the wound is very small, so there's uh, the the vision recovery is very fast. Frequently, patient will have something like sixty to eighty percent of vision improvement. A few hours after the surgery, the next day or two, they will see something like 90 over percent or beyond. Okay, and the result is very predictable. So nowadays, we even call a cataract surgery a refractive cataract surgery because we can actually bring the patient's power. Let's say patient is highly short sighted of having 600 or 800 degree, we can bring this power down to close to zero. Or patients who are unhappy with wearing reading glasses or multifocal glasses after the surgery, they probably able to choose a lens that enable them to be glasses free most of the time after the surgery. So this is how uh, uh, the advances in in cataract surgery nowadays that we are doing. Now there is also uh, at times you may you may come across in the newspaper some advertisement talking about bladeless cataract surgery. Actually, this is where this machine come into the picture. It's called a femto cataract surgery. Um, this is actually a procedure where you we use instead of using a blade to cut the wound for the surgery, we are using a laser to make incision or the cut on the uh, on the eye before the surgery. So, in actual fact, this. The function of these machines only take up less than 10% of the entire surgery because after making all the wound, the patient eyes, the cataract still has to be removed with the current technology, which is the phaco emulsification. So it actually, uh, even though this machine is actually available in Tun Hussein on, but uh, we not generally we do not do very often for our patient because unless patient really specifically request for it. From the because of uh, you know they think this is better from uh, get influence from the uh, advertisement or uh, social media or they have their own mindset that they want to be uh, platelets you know otherwise most of the time patient will not benefit any additional advantage from using this machine in fact it takes up additional ten more minutes or more surgical time. And also, patient had to pay extra because of additional equipment uh, to make just the, the wound. So most of the time, it's actually a, a marketing tool. Okay. Now, the other advances in cataract surgery is the advancement in the lenses available nowadays. Now, previously, as you can see here, I'm showing you three different uh, uh, the lenses, the two, 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 two lenses picture here. They look almost similar, but the difference is that one is actually called a rigid lens, where you can't, uh, you can't, uh, it's hard lens, the lens is hard, okay? So this is normally used in uh, the surgical method or called ECCE method. Um, the other lens that generally and frequently used in phaco emulsification is uh, soft lenses, con uh, consists of either acrylic or silicon material. As you can see here, the lens looks about the same, but it can be folded or rolled up and put into a, 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 a small injector that we can go through this 2.2 uh, to 2.75 millimeter kind of uh, incision. So uh, we do not have to enlarge the wound to implant the lens. Not only that, the current uh, lens technology enable the, the patient and the, 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 the surgeon to offer to the patient whether they want us, wanted to go for a single power where we call a monofocal lens or a multifocal lens. So these are some of the picture of a monofocal and a multifocal and a bifocal where you can see there's a two different layers and some rings in this multifocal 
uh, in plant. So what is the difference between a, a monofocal and a multifocal uh, in plant? Mainly uh, is monofocal. If let's say the patient can see, as you can see from this picture, the patient can see the distant object very well, but they can't see near. So what what uh, what it will need to be done to senior is that they just have to put on the reading glasses to senior. If they don't mind to use the reading glasses, that's not a problem. But however, some of the patient may may want to be glasses free most of the time. They want to uh, they are social active. They are they are they are they are have a living a like active lifestyle and they prefer not to wear glasses most of the time. Then they can choose this so-called multifocal uh, implant or lenses that enable them to see far as well as near at the same time. Okay, so not only we have a multifocal implant, we also have a lens called toric lens. Okay, this lens enable us to correct astigmatism. Uh, it's not easy for most audience uh, to understand what is astigmatism. Now, in simple uh, uh, way to show you is that now, if let's say an eye has no astigmatism, okay, this is called cylinder. Huh? Astigmatism in terms of optical, we call cylinder. Let's say there's no astigmatism. An eye that with no astigmatism is zero power. This is the quality of letter that they see, okay? If they're 50 degree, then this is the quality of vision that they see, and this is 100 degree. Now, even though, let's say for this line, RZVDE, Okay, you know, most of the time when you go to optical shop or in eye center, eye clinic, when they check your vision, they ask you to read some letter or some numbers. Okay, so even though this patient, patient A can read this, patient B can read this, patient C can read this, but the quality of vision of patient A, B, and C are totally different. Okay, so this toric lens is enable patient to, let's say they have they have a, a, a astigmatism that is higher than uh, 100 degree to be corrected to close to as close to zero as possible. Just this is just another uh, slide to show you a simulated uh, picture of astigmatism. I can I think I'll jump on this. So the other question is when should I one or you know patient will frequently ask when should I go for the surgery okay now because of the current technology is so safe so predictable and the risk is very very low the question the answer to this is actually at any stage of the cataract development now as long as the patient feel that the visual impairment or the blurry of vision is affecting their daily activities for instance they like to watch tv okay so now they find that they are not enjoying the tv so much because they can't actually see the the the, the images that clear or they like to do driving but the night driving is giving them a lot of problem or they can't read their their uh, uh novel uh, uh so well things like that okay things that they used to enjoy a lot now they have to give up because uh, they find that their, their vision is not good enough for them to see, then that is the time to consider to have the surgery done. My, my advice to my patient uh, in most cases is don't wait until you can't even see your fingers, okay? Now, when it comes to cataract, the longer the patient wait, the more mature is the cataract. When the cataract become more and more mature, the surgical time to remove the lens will be longer and any surgery that is uh, taking longer time will have higher chance of en ending up with a problem, uh, complication, and so on. So don't wait until you can't even see your finger, okay? Whenever the vision is affected, uh, your daily activities, that is the time to really seriously consider to have it done, okay? So uh, lastly, I would like to uh, share with you uh, a short a clip of a cataract surgery. Uh, this is the incision that we used to make, which is about 2.4 millimeter incision. Now, this is the, the lens. Imagine a lens like a, a piece of uh, egg, okay? So what we do now, initial step is to break up the shell, uh, the shell of the egg, the in front part of the shell of the egg, okay? 
So in the lens, of course, it's just a membrane that we peel it off. Okay. So imagine as a as a, a an, an egg. Okay. So the shell in front is 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 uh, we remove it and then we suck out the content. Okay. So this is as you can see here. Now the lens is removed pieces by pieces. Now you see that by using the ultrasound energy, we will slowly can uh, just at the tip here, the lens is being emulsified. That means that it melt down into tiny, minute, minute particles, and then it gets sucked out from the same opening. You can see here again, right? There's no movement of this thing. It's actually ultrasonic energy, okay? So once the catheter is removed, a new lens like this, okay? There are many design and uh, 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 as I mentioned before, functionality as well. So a new lens is implanted. So where does that lens goes to? It goes back into the original position of the eggshell, okay, of the lens, huh? because we did not break the membrane. You can see here, there's still uh, the front lining of the membrane, okay? And the entire back is still intact so that the lens, that the new lens that we implanted into the eye sit is sitting nicely in the original position okay so that's uh that's all for my talk today so uh thank you for your attention and uh you can ask me some questions uh after this all right well that was an informative uh, talk on cataract surgery thank you doctor for sharing uh, it looks like we have uh, quite a number of questions here from our viewer mm -hmm. Uh, after follow up, my father was told by an ophthalmologist that he's mm. starting to develop cataract in one eye. How Sorry? long should after what? After he follow up with the ophthalmologist, he developed a cataract in one eye. Only one uh, eye, okay. Ah, uh, one line. So how <laughs> long should he wait for the surgery to be done, or should they wait until both eyes to have cataract then only do the surgery? Okay. This is a very good question because it uh, all depends on whether the patient uh, wear glasses or not, okay? Now, if let's say the patient is a very high short-sighted person, so let's say, for instance, 500 or 600 degree, and unfortunately, this patient developed only one cataract in one eye. And if the eye is not seeing well, of course, if the patient wants to see well, and doctor already diagnosed the patient has cataract, then the only solution is go for a cataract surgery, okay? Now, but in this scenario, it's a bit tricky because if they go for cataract surgery in that particular eye, after the surgery, we are actually able to put in a lens and to be able to bring the power down to close to zero. So that means actually the patient after the surgery, they can see distant well without glasses, okay? But here comes a problem because one eye is zero power. Then the non-operated eye is still 500 degree. Okay, so there will be severe imbalance and patient will feel very giddy, whether glass with glasses or without glasses. So in this kind of scenario, usually as a, con as a uh, uh, um, eye doctor, we will actually advise the patient and inform the patient that likely after the surgery of the first eye, they have to go for the surgery on the second eye early, okay, in order to balance the vision, okay. So, and again, I mentioned in my presentation also, cataract surgery is a very successful, very predictable, very low risk procedure. So they do not have to worry. They can still also go for surgery to the other eye and have good balanced vision uh, for both eyes after the surgery. All right. Okay, thank, uh, okay, thank you, doctor. There's another question. Does cataract surgery last a lifetime? Can oh, you yes. watch TV? <laughs> yeah as After you can see as you can see you know the lens the, is entirely removed and replaced a new lens so cataract will not come back again so cataract surgery performed one time only okay to each eye it will not come back again all right uh there's another one do i have to stay overnight in the hospital after my cataract surgery or can i be discharged on the same day yeah, cataract surgery is performed as a day care procedure nowadays. So in fact, the cataract procedure usually lasts less than half an hour. Okay. But most of the time, they probably have to be in the hospital for about half a day or at least two to three hours because of, you know, they got to come early to register, put some drop, get some advice. 
and then uh, uh, then wait for their turn to go for the surgery. After the surgery, they will advise to rest for a while before they actually uh, you know take the medicine and go home. So the whole duration probably you know will will be two two out two two three hours or even half a day, but the actual procedure is less than half an hour. All right, uh, doctor. If you have an elderly patient, can you do an early detection to see cataract with uh, retinoscopy? If can, what do you usually see? If you can detect cataract with retinoscopy, or how would you describe it? Well, um, yeah, definitely because uh, cataract means the lens must become opaque or cloudy. So if we use the ophthalmoscopy, you can't see the you can't the light can't pass through the lens uh, uh, um, uh, easily. That means there is some uh, cloudiness of the lens obstructing the light from getting in. So from there, we can actually judge and tell that there's, there's some cataract in that lens. All right. Um, there's another one. How long will a procedure take? I'm afraid to be put to sleep under a general anesthetic. Can it be done under a local anesthetic? Uh, I thought I mentioned about time just now. And uh, I just go straight to the second second question about uh, local, local anesthetic. anesthetic. Most of the time, the surgery is done under some eye drops only. Okay, some anesthetic eye drop, of course, uh, in some cases, uh, con uh, patients who are very anxious or the concern feel more comfortable, they may give some injection around the eye so that uh, the patient will not feel any pain during the procedure. Okay, all right. Uh, Doctor, last question. Does cataract surgery also fix other vision problems such as far-sightedness and near-sightedness? Will you be able to get rid of glasses after cataract surgery is done? Yes, definitely. You know, uh, if the patients, uh, other than having cataract, has no other problem, okay. Most of the time, before a cataract surgery, we'll actually evaluate the eye uh, properly from the front to the back to make sure there's there's no other uh, problem or comorbidity. Now, don't forget, a lot of time patients who had cataract are those who are elderly, 60, 70, or even 80 years old. So, uh, frequently, not not occasion, but frequently this patient may also have other problems of the eye as well. Say, for instance, glaucoma, retina problem, uh, cornea problem, and so on. So if they, are, if they do have some other comorbidity, we call this comorbidity, then they may not be a good candidate to go for a premier lenses or the type of lenses that enable patient to see far and near. But however, if the patient is a younger patient with only cataract but no other problem, and they are wearing uh, multifocal glasses before the surgery, then there is an option where they can actually choose to go to, to have it after the cataract surgery to have this implant where mm -hmm. it can help to correct far and near as well. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chong, for all the answers. Um, so in interest of time, I'm afraid that we won't be able to address any more questions for now, but keep the questions coming, perhaps later at the end of the session. We will get Dr. Chong to answer all those questions. Thank all you. Right, thank you, Dr. Chong. All right. Let's let's got let's get going with our next interesting topic. Glaucoma is one of the common causes of blindness. Half of the people with glaucoma don't know that they have it. So let's discover more about glaucoma from our speaker. With this, I welcome Dato. Dr. Linda Tio, senior consultant ophthalmologist and glaucoma, on with her topic. Do you know glaucoma, a silent thief of sight? Over to you, Dr. Dr. Linda. Thank you, Ranusha. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon to everybody. Um, this is a very interesting topic because a lot of people have not much information about glaucoma. Do you know who is the silent thief of sight? Glaucoma has been considered as the silent thief of sight because a lot of patients present late when they have already lost some amount of vision. So what do you know about glaucoma? For, uh, why do we want to talk about glaucoma now? It's because um, from March the 7th to the March the 13th, all over the world, we celebrate International World Glaucoma Week. The idea of having the World Glaucoma Week is to create awareness amongst everybody that glaucoma is potential blinding eye disease. So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a very 
is a chronic eye disease that causes damage to the optic nerve. That is the nerve that comes up from the eye that goes to the brain. And this results in serious vision loss. It has been known to be a leading cause of irreversible blindness. I stress on the word irreversible blindness because this blindness cannot be reversed even though you go for treatment. It's unlike cataracts, whereby when you have cataract which causes blurring of vision and drop of vision, when you remove the cataract, you can improve your eyesight. So the important part about glaucoma is that no matter what time you see the patient, if there is damage to the glaucoma, uh, from the glaucoma to the nerves, there is no way to reverse the blindness. So actually, it is a, 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 a disease that can be preventable provided we catch it early. So this picture shows you roughly where glaucoma is uh, uh, about. And the important part of the eye that we want to stress on is here, the eyeball, there's a fluid inside the eye that maintains the shape of the eye, the gel, the vitreous gel. And in front of the eye, that's the anterior chamber, that's where you have the liquid aqueous formed by the eye, and this all maintain the uh, healthiness of the eye. Unfortunately, the amount of aqueous that's produced by the eye cannot be got rid of. So that means there's a built-up pressure inside the eye. So when the built-up pressure causes damage to the optic nerve, this is the nerve that comes out from the back of the eye that goes to the brain and whereby your brain interprets what you see. So when we have got glaucoma in the eye, the pressure builds up and slowly, slowly, it causes damage to this optic nerve. And this presents as visual field loss. So knowing that, we want to know who are the people who are at risk for glaucoma. So we want to consider the patient as a whole, and we also want to consider certain factors that are related to the eye. As a whole, the patient, we know that glaucoma is more common in patients who are more than 40 years old. However, we must stress that we can even have newborn babies who have uh, congenital glaucoma, and we have children who develop glaucoma as they grow older. Those are called juvenile glaucoma, but the majority of uh, glaucoma presents after the age of 40. So that means to say the older you get, the higher the risk of developing glaucoma. So besides that, we have found that people uh, of the pigmented race, that means to say in, in countries like you have a lot of Caucasians that like you have in, in America and in Europe, we find that the pigmented races like the, the Blacks and the uh, people like us who are the like Asian races, we are at a higher risk of getting glaucoma compared to the uh, Caucasians. Then the family history, when there's somebody else in the family who has had glaucoma, it is important that you realize you should go for a glaucoma checkup as soon as you can after the age of 40 because there are certain types of glaucoma that presents in the same family. I've had families of patients whereby one whole group of them, all the ladies get angle closure glaucoma and I have another group whereby all the men get the open angle glaucoma. So that means to say that as long as there's a family, a person with glaucoma in the family, it is ideal and it is important for you to go for a glaucoma checkup at least once in your lifetime. Patients who have got vascular disease, you see patients who have got diabetes, when you have uncontrolled diabetes, it can lead to complications of diabetes and one of them causes glaucoma in the eye. And patients who have got vasospasm, like patients who often have migraine and they are patients who have uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, means that even in a hot environment, these patients always feel cold, their fingers and toes always feel cold. So these are some forms of vasospasm. That means to say there's some form of spasm of the blood vessel and there's not a very good blood supply to the limbs. And sometimes this group of patients have a higher risk of getting glaucoma as well. I mentioned uncontrolled diabetes earlier. And what about the eye factors? Some patients have, uh, naturally have a higher pressure than normal. We want to know that the normal eye pressure that a patient has, a normal person, is between 10 to 20 millimeters mercury. Uh, of course, there's about plus minus one to two millimeters mercury. But those patients uh, who have routinely, normally they have pressures of more than 20, like 25, 26, they are at a higher risk of having glaucoma. And these are the type of patients who should have a regular checkup. Patients who have central corneal thickness, which are thinner than 550 micron, especially those patients who have got LASIK before, because when you go for refractive surgery, the laser surgery thins out your cornea. And these are the type of patients who normally have missed glaucoma because they don't realize that the central corneal thickness being thinner than normal, 
makes them uh, very difficult to detect whether they've got glaucoma or not. So if a doctor who sees you and do a normal screening is unaware that you have had LASIK done before, the normal pressure that the, the pressure that the doctor checks at that time may be normal, but it is actually higher than what it should be. And again, we look at the nerve structure, the optic disc, the one that I mentioned earlier. Some people are born with larger cup disc ratio. That means to say the opening in the nerve where the nerve is coming out of the eye compared to the structure the opening the size of the nerve compared to the opening it is larger than normal some patients are born with this large cup this ratio and these are the people who are glaucoma suspect and they make them at a higher risk of getting glaucoma sometimes some patients who may have hypertension or diabetes we notice that they have some form of bleeding spot at the optic disc that means at the nerve structure but they do not have any other problems when they have hemorrhage like this it means to say that there's some form of uh, ischemia or not enough blood supply to the eye and these are the people who have a higher risk of glaucoma as well so as i mentioned earlier the normal pressure of the eye is between 12 to 21. patients normally with glaucoma experience higher pressure so those patients have high pressures they may be more than 20 they may be 30 at the time of presentation they have high pressure on the other hand we have got patients who have normal pressure glaucoma these are the patients whom i mentioned earlier who have some form of blood uh, disorder or vasospasm that means to say there's a, uh, a spasm of the blood vessel and they do not have enough blood supply to their uh, eyes to the optic nerve uh, and they have a higher risk of getting normal tension glaucoma but the patient must realize that in a one day the pressure does not remain the same i have got patients who come and say oh how come doctor to now i check the pressure is 10 uh, but one hour later, the pressure has gone to 12 or 13. Patient must know that there's a normal variant of pressure. That means to say that you see the pressure can go from uh, changes within the whole day. It doesn't mean that the pressure remains the same the whole day. So in order for us to understand glaucoma, which part of the eye is affected? So looking at the normal structure of the eye, which is important for us is this area, which is called the anterior chamber angle. So this is where the drainage of the fluid that is produced of, by the eye is removed from the eye. So fluid is produced here and is removed through this drainage system out of the eye. So, and then when the pressure builds up, this is the back of the eye where you have the optic nerve or the nerve of the eye, which goes to the brain. And this is where the damage takes place. So what types of glaucoma we have? Actually, there are more than 40 types of glaucoma, but we can classify them into big uh, groups, which is the open angle. That means to say that the angles of the eye remain open, yet the patients develop glaucoma because of backward pressure. Then we have those patients who got narrow angles and those patients who, have pro who present with sudden closure of the eyes, which is closed angle. And where open angle and, and closed angles are concerned, we can still talk about primary. Primary means that there's no underlying cause that causes this problem. Secondary means that there's some underlying problem, such as when you have injury to the eye, such as when you have uncontrolled diabetes, which causes complications to the eye, and such as for patients who unnecessarily take long-term steroid use for the eye, and these people develop secondary glaucoma. Others are very little, like congenital glaucoma, like juvenile glaucoma. Even the congenital glaucoma and juvenile glaucoma, also you can talk in terms of open and angle closure. So whenever we have a patient who comes with blurring of vision, we must always remember glaucoma. And we have patients who want to know and want to screen for glaucoma. What are the things that we normally ask them? One of it is blurring of vision and discomfort. A lot of patients after the age of 40 will have blurring of vision because they need glasses. And some of them will have visual discomfort because they have dry eyes. So we have to differentiate whether they have just normal aging changes in the eyes or where we have got glaucoma. These are just uh, different types of glaucoma. Uh, what makes a, a ring a bell to the earth is that whenever patients complain about they see colored light rings around the lights or such as hello or such as rainbow, when they look at the lights in the house or when they look at the lights of the, uh, of the car which is coming in front of them. So when they see hellos around the rings of the, of the lights, it could be a possible indication that they have increased pressure in the eye. Uh, that could be possibly be due to glaucoma. But of course, these patients, we must differentiate them from having migraine. 
A lot of patients can have glare, but glare can be due to migraine and can be due to cataract as well. So when patients have complaint symptoms like glare, we again have to make sure that they are not having any glaucoma problems. Patients who have got glaucoma have difficulty adapting from light to dark. That means to say that when they go out from the bright place and they suddenly go to a dark room, they find that it's very difficult for them to get adapted to the environment. So usually patients who have the glaucoma have problems walking around or finding their way in the dark. And, but Having said that, we must differentiate them for patients who have retinal problems such as um, retinitis pigmentosa, where they have also problems with light dark adaptation. But patients who have got glaucoma are known to have difficulty following uh, fast moving objects, such as when they hit a, a golf ball or they play tennis, they find they have difficulty following tracking the ball. So when patients have got this, story, this history, when they complain to you, it is important for us to, to check for glaucoma. So here we are talking about primary open angle glaucoma. This is a form of glaucoma which is the most common form because most of the patients come with open angle. So now we are looking at the cross-section drawing of the eye and this is the drainage system. So notice here the drainage system is open. This is the iris or brown color of the tissue of the eye. This is the cornea. So this space is called uh, the angle of the eye and this uh, remains open. So what happens in this case, the fluid that is formed inside the eye here can move through the drainage system. However, there is resistance to the drainage. It's such that they cannot flow properly, so they have a backward pressure. And this grows very slowly because it is still remaining open. Patients do not feel any symptoms. The patients do not have eye pain. They do not have uh, any problems until quite late when they find that the vision has dropped. And this situation where we have a primary open angle, it progresses very slowly. So patient doesn't realize they have damage until it is quite late. That is why we say glaucoma is a uh, silent teeth of sight. Mm. And open angle glaucoma, this is the most prevalent type, and a lot of times we can get the pressure between 30, 40, 50, but the patients don't feel any pain. So, this backward pressure causes progressive damage to the optic nerve, and the patient gradually develop a visual field loss. It can happen in both eyes at different stage of, uh, of development, but majority of the patients they present very late. And most times, most, it will be not un, unusual to have patients who have got advanced glaucoma in both eyes. So how does your age affect you for developing glaucoma? We find that majority of the patients who develop glaucoma are 50 and 60 years and above. When you have a younger age, you can have a potentially develop glaucoma if you have uh, underlying problems like you have injury to the eye, you have uncontrolled diabetes, or you have got very strong family history. But majority of the time where patients develop as a result of aging is usually more than 60 years. So the older you are, the higher the risk of getting glaucoma. And open angle glaucoma is, could be related to the degeneration of the trabecular mesh. This is the area of the anterior chamber of the angle, which I mentioned earlier. So the idea of treatment for open angle glaucoma is mainly to reduce the intraocular pressure because when we reduce intraocular pressure, we sort of protect the visual field. So patient must realize that when we do the treatment for glaucoma, it's long term. Glaucoma is a lifelong disease. It doesn't mean that when your pressure is controlled, you can stop using the medicine. On the other hand, we have angle closure glaucoma, whereby the patient presents with pain, sudden pain in the eye, sudden headache, sudden blurring of vision. This is because where the anterior chamber angle, the drainage system suddenly closes. So maybe the patient is already having a potentially narrow angle and the patient watches TV in the dark or decide to switch off the light and look at things at the TV or, or play their computer games in the dark. Suddenly the pupil becomes dilated in the dark, which is natural because when we are in the dark, the pupil uh, becomes larger in size to accommodate our vision. So when the pupil enlarge, uh, becomes larger, suddenly it closes up the drainage system. So when this happens, the, the fluid in the eye cannot flow through the angle. So you have a sudden increase in pressure, which is transmitted to the back of the eye. And the patient will present with a, a severe headache that usually is an elderly patient. Uh, then we have patients who have severe headache. They usually go and see the GP because of the headaches. And they, if the pressure is too high, they may even complain of uh, uh, blurring of vision and uh, they may have nausea, they have vomiting. So when they go and see the GP, this is the form of acute glaucoma, which is, can be considered as a medical emergency. So if you catch the patient early and treat them, we can relieve the pressure and then we can treat the, uh, the patient accordingly to prevent further attacks. 
Okay, most of us are familiar with glaucoma because we everybody knows that it's a condition whereby the, the pressure in the eye is high, higher than normal. But there is another group of glaucoma which is very common among Asians and especially those of Japanese origin, which is called normal tension glaucoma. In this case, whereby we have patients whose pressures are within normal, but when we check them, we find that the nerves, are, the optic nerve is damaged and they have damage to the visual field and the visual function. And you can you check the eye, you'll find that there's optic nerve damage as well. Why it happens, we do not know. We do not know what's the underlying condition, but we feel that this happens because the patient's pressure, although it's within normal, it causes to damage to the nerve because the eye nerves are more sensitive to the pressure than usual. So in this case, where the normal tension glaucoma, we have to bring the pressure much lower down than the new normal range. So when you have glaucoma, what do the patients feel? Actually, in the early part of early thing, early uh, stage of glaucoma, you do not feel anything. That's why the patients do not feel they have lost the vision unless they have they present with sudden acute angle closure glaucoma. So no, most patients with normal tension glaucoma and patients with primary open angle glaucoma, they have normal vision and they do not realize that they have got glaucoma which suddenly affect the peripheral vision. So if you check a patient with normal pressure glau uh, and glaucoma and early primary open angle glaucoma, the loss of vision starts in the periphery as seen here, which is a darker area. And as the glaucoma progresses without any treatment at all, you find that the visual field becomes more and more constricted. So this is peripheral visual loss, which is very typical of glaucoma. And majority of the patient, by the time they present, they've got a very advanced glaucoma and they only have a central island of view left. Surprisingly, when you talk to the patient, they'll tell you, doctor, my vision is still very good. Yes, the vision is still very good. Because when you talk about good vision, we are talking about visual acuity. But when you talk about glaucoma, we are talking about, about the visual field. The visual field is the amount of area that you can see around you when you cl look straight, close one eye, and looking with one eye, you can see the periphery. So when you uh, examine patients with advanced glaucoma, you find that the peripheral vision Peripheral vision is gone, is damaged, and only the center part is left behind. So that is why patients present late. And many times when we look at patients, we not only first diagnose glaucoma, after we diagnose glaucoma, we have to progress, follow the progression of the patient. Because by treating the patient alone, we cannot be sure that we have managed to control the glaucoma. So how we manage to progress uh, or uh, how to say, we managed to uh, uh, follow up the patient is we check the nerve and we do the visual field. So as you can see, as the glaucoma damage the nerves more, the visual field becomes worse. This is very advanced glaucoma and this is normal. And this could be just very early glaucoma whereby little bits are affected. So how do we diagnose glaucoma? There are many ways where we diagnose glaucoma. First is we check the pressure in the eye. So we put the patient at the slit lamp, which is a special machine that we check the eye. It's a sort of like a microscope which we can use at high power. And we put local anesthetic in the eye and we use this special machine to check the power of the eye. And uh, when we get the pressure more than 20, we consider as a glaucoma suspect. Then we look at the nerve which is at the back of the eye. This one, the nerve looks very big, shown by the error. And this usually suggests that it is a potential glaucoma patient. So usually when we see patients with this enlarged cup disc ratio, we always advise patients to examine further for glaucoma. Then we need to monitor the visual field function. So by that, we do the automated periphery. This is for us to test the patient one eye at a time to see how much visual function has been affected by the patient. A lot of patients do not like this, this test because it's not easy to do. It needs a lot of concentration, but it takes time for the patient to learn how to do this. But this is the most important part of examination for the eye, both for diagnosing glaucoma as well as for following up the progression of the glaucoma. In besides that, we need to, do, to look at the structure of the eye. By looking at the structure of the eye, we examine the retinal nerve fiber by this machine, which we usually call OCT, HRT, or GDX. So these different type of machines uh, have the same function, that is to check the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Because when the nerves have got uh, damage, usually when you have got glaucoma, first to be damaged will be the nerve, nerve structure. The nerve structure is damaged, then only the nerve function comes on. So when you have very early glaucoma, sometimes the visual field may still be normal, but you can detect the damage into in the structure of the nerve fiber layer. So this is an important part of the test for glaucoma. 
So when we have done the, the, the test for glaucoma and we confirm the patient has got glaucoma, we must try to prevent further damage. And how do we try to prevent further damage? We go start the patient on treatment. Usually we start the patient on just eye drops. And the goal of the treatment is to preserve as much visual function as possible throughout the patient's lifetime. We do not want to sacrifice the vision, but we do not want the patient to spend unnecessarily for the uh, treatment. However, uh, for glaucoma, we now realize that glaucoma medication is rather expensive. So the patient may have to consider other options of treatment. So this is how we try to control the patient's pressure. Ideally, we just use eye drops. If the patient using one or two eye drops alone, that is it's not too bad, it's tolerable. But when the patient goes up to maximum medication, we use more than two or three medication and there's, or there's no more medication left. And then we find that the patient is progressing. We may consider laser surgery. We may consider surgery to the eye for a, consider a filtration surgery, which is for us to improve the function uh, of flow for the aqueous flow out of the eye to control the pressure. We can even use glaucoma drainage devices, mainly for patients who have got uh, glaucoma like neovascular glaucoma which is due to uncontrolled diabetes or which is due to um, ischemic problems in the eye because of the blood supply to the eye they have a different type of glaucoma which is very very difficult to treat and so most of the time we use the drainage devices having said that this is the range of treatment we have nowadays we have more and more new treatment which are called minimally invasive glaucoma surgery and you may have heard about it in the newspapers or you may have listened to patients who have it stands done such as the eye stand and such as the zen implantation which are newer forms of treatment for glaucoma and which is minimally invasive to the eye and hopefully have minimal side effects however what we need to stress is even though we do not know the cause of glaucoma such as in the normal tension glaucoma the idea of treatment is still mainly to lower the intraocular pressure or to decrease the intraocular pressure and control it because this has been the most pro proven efficacious way to control further progression in eye and what is important is that we patients must realize that treatment is individualized. Patient A and patient B may not have the same kind of treatment because we have to see what the individual patient requires and we adapt the treatment accordingly. So how to prevent glaucoma? So as we know, when the patient has got coma in the early stage, the patients may not have any symptoms. So if your patients have got a family history of glaucoma or patients have got injury to the eye before or patient has been using steroid for a long time in the eye because they, pay, they may have been using it to treat their allergic conjunctivitis. Some patients have allergy, they happily go to the, to the pharmacy and buy the uh, steroids and put in the eye. These are the patients who have a potential of developing glaucoma. A lot of times patients may have just a little bit of red eye and they go to the pharmacy and buy medication, ask the, asking the pharmacist to, to recommend drugs to them. Unknowingly, they are given some form of uh, a steroid eye drop. And when you use steroid eye drops in the eye, you will feel very comfortable. So these patients may continue using it and un and unfortunately, long-term use of glaucoma in patients who are susceptible to it, they can develop steroid-induced glaucoma, which is a secondary form of glaucoma. And patients don't detect it and don't know that they've got glaucoma until very late stage when they just go for an examination. So regular comprehensive examination of the eye is important and crucial in detecting glaucoma. So we know that if we can initiate treatment immediately when we detect a glaucoma, when we detect through screening, it is helpful for us to prevent further progression and further visual field loss. So you know when to get your eyes checked because the earlier we make the diagnosis, the less the damage will be done and the more the vision will be safe. And, and uh, treatment for glaucoma is very individualized and we have to see according to the age of the patient. For younger patients, we have to be more aggressive with the treatment because they have a longer lifespan in front of, ahead of them. For the elderly patients, we usually just uh, treat as necessary, we won't be so aggressive with them. So if you have a potential uh, glaucoma, uh, uh, like, uh, like you have a history of family history of glaucoma, or you have a history of uh, family history, or you have been using steroid before, or you have uh, other things like trauma to the eye, maybe even before the age of 40, you should have your eyes checked at least once every two to four years. After the age of 40 to 60, at least one to two years or three years, and after the age of 60, I think it's important for you to have your eyes checked every year. What the patients do not realize is most of you will say, oh, we go and make a special uh, checkup or make a special appointment to get a wellness checkup. You want to check for your heart, you want to check for your, your uh, 
blood sugar, your the cholesterol, and so on. But what is important, you, you always forget about your vision. So besides doing a wellness checkup, I think you should consider having an eye checkup too because you do not want to lose your vision from glaucoma, which is a preventable source of blindness. So with that, uh, that comes to an end of my short discussion on glaucoma. Uh, Ranusha, you can uh, open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Rotelita. Therefore, please be sure glaucoma cannot be prevented, but if it's diagnosed and treated early, the disease can be controlled. All right, heading to our Q&A session, uh, Dr. There's an, uh, there's, an uh, there's an optometrist uh, recently said, you know, there's an opti uh, there's a, this this question optometrist recently said my grandmother is in pre glaucoma what does this mean and what should i do about it um usually what optometrists they do when you see them they are supposed to be trained to be able to detect the nerve changes in the eye meaning they look at the structure of the eye they can tell you uh, that the nerve size looks larger than normal and they can do what you call a uh, uh, air path tonometry. They use a special machine to check the eye pressure. So what they can tell you is that you are a potential patient for glaucoma. I don't know what she means by you have a, a free glaucoma because when you have those things that are picked up at screening, then we can only do further tests for like doing the visual field and the optic nerve function for the optic nerve function as well as checking the structure. Then only you can tell whether you are pre-glaucoma or you're early glaucoma or late glaucoma. Optometrist wise, uh, they are not really trained to be able to tell you uh, what type of glaucoma you have. But they can do the screening for you, they can check the pressure and they can look at the size of the nerve. But they should advise the patient to go for further checkup. Uh, there's another question. I have an open angle glaucoma on both eye and had a treble culectomy surgery on the 13th January 2021 on, on my left eye. I am off steroid and antibiotic already. To date, my eye is still blurry. The droppy eye leak didn't help. Now I'm on Vismat Multi four times a day. Will I get my vision back? Okay. Uh, it depends on how much was the vision before the operation. Most of the time, I would tell the patient, when we do a trabeculectomy for you, it is mainly the function of the trabeculectomy is to help us control the pressure. It's not to make your vision better. It also depends on whether the patient develops cataract after the surgery. Some patients develop cataract very fast after a glaucoma operation. If the patient develops cataract, that will result in blurring of vision as well. What I can suggest is the patient should have a refraction done see whether there's any changes to the refractive status. That means to say whether you need glasses to help improve the vision. And also check and see whether the patient has dry eyes. Uh, you see, I, the patient mentioned that he's using the Vismat four times a day. So probably he or she is having uh, dry eyes. So if the cornea is dry because of the dry eyes, you may affect the vision as well. And of course, you can to check again how much is the visual field uh, function the patient has. All right, uh, moving on. Gla my grandmother had glaucoma. What are the chances of me getting it? And at what age should I start checking my eye for glaucoma? Did uh, you mention how old the patient is? No, I think okay. no, there's no, yeah. I have mentioned already, as long as there's a family history of glaucoma, there's a very strong chance that the patient will develop glaucoma. So usually, if you know that you have a family history of glaucoma, then it's advisable for you to check at least once, in your, uh, even though you're young, up to before the age of 30, you should even have it checked at least once. So, but you find that there's no abnormality, then you can wait until maybe two or three years later to check. Because we do not know when you can get glaucoma. As long as you have a strong family history, there's a chance that you may develop glaucoma. Mm. All right, thank you. Uh, next, can a person who has glaucoma and cataract surgery wear contact lens for cosmetic purposes? All right, it depends on what type of glaucoma surgery. If we talk in terms of trabeculectomy, which is the fistulizing surgery where you do an operation to create a pathway out of the eye for the fluid to flow, it's not ideal for you to wear contact lens. This is because when you do the surgery, the fluid inside the eye can move out of the eye. So there is always a risk that organisms like germs can go inside the eye. So as long as the, the, the trabeculectomy is functioning, if you put a contact lens on the eye, 
he may not he may not sit well on the cornea because when you have the crystallizing surgery done what happens is that you have a little puffy uh, area above the eyeball where the surgery is done so because of that the contact lens may not fit nicely on it number one and then if you use contact lens for a long time possibly that the contact lens may have some may introduce some infection into the eye so ideally you should not wear contact lens for long term basis um, next question, if there's an additional risk to have cataract if a person who has glaucoma? Uh, I think at this stage, we should mention that any patient who has got uh, surgery before, whether it's for glaucoma or whether it's for vitro retinal, like the retinal problems or, or vitro retinal function problem, they are always at the risk of getting uh, cataract, developing cataract as time goes on. They may develop earlier than normal. And um, how long does it take to go blind if you didn't follow up for glaucoma? That's a $1 million question. If everybody knows when they're going to become blind, you can prevent it. We don't know. It all depends on the progression of the glaucoma. You see, I've got patients whereby they are very consistent with the eye drops, and yet the glaucoma progresses very fast. On the other hand, I've got patients who, who happily forget about the eye drops, they don't put on the eye drops, and yet they don't progress. So it's a $1 million question. If only we can have the answer. So we do not really know how fast the glaucoma progresses. All right. Okay. And last question. Uh, can glaucoma be cured? Patient has history of angle closure glaucoma. What type of medication should this patient avoid? Okay, to answer the first question, glaucoma cannot be cured. Glaucoma can only be prevented. That is why we stress on the importance of, of, of uh, screening and we stress on the importance of monitoring the glaucoma all throughout the patient's life. Glaucoma is a lifelong disease, which I always stress to my new patients that they cannot be cured of glaucoma. And number two, if a patient has acute angle closure glaucoma before, it is important, number one, for patients not to use things like uh, medication when they have running nose and cough. They must mention it to their doctor when the doctor prescribed them that they have had uh, angle closure before. So they should avoid uh, medication that helps the, the it prevents the running nose and the cough because it may induce a sudden attack. Having said that, now I address to younger uh, patients, such as those patients who like to take medication to cut down the appetite, to help them to, how to say, to decrease their weight in the, in the effort to control the weight loss, their no weight, so that they remain slim. So those slimming medications that you take, they can cause sudden attack of glaucoma. I've had young patients who develop bilateral, that means both under acute attack of glaucoma, because the medication that they use uh, causes a, a angle closure glaucoma. Mm. And right. patients who have got angle closure glaucoma should avoid watching TV in the dark. I think that's all questions we have for glaucoma for now. Uh, we have one question for Dr. Chong. Um, can we have Dr. Chong on? <laughs> yeah, doctor, uh, there's some cases where artificial lens dislocated after the surgery and some people notice some vision changes years after the surgery. Will there be any complications or any risk if, if they went for their second lens replacement? Um, whether there is lens dislocated, dislocated means we are talking about the, the, the lens that we implanted has moved away from the original position. Okay. Now, if it has moved away from the original position, that means patient probably having vision problem. For instance, they see double or they can't see well. So if they're happy with this double vision and happy with the poor vision, they don't want to do surgery, nobody can force them to go for surgery. However, if they think that is disturbing them, they want to see better, then the only solution is surgery. So they have to ask themselves this question, do they want to see better? If they want to see better, the only solution is surgery. In any surgery, of course, there's always a risk huh, of surgery. Now, with cataract surgery, I mentioned before, the risk of cataract surgery is there, but it's very, very small. Okay, In general speaking, cataract surgery is a very safe, very predictable, and very good outcome procedure. However, beyond that, say, for instance, the patient has a, a, 
a lens that has moved away from the original position it's a totally different ball game altogether huh? it's a common procedure where we remove the cataract and put in a lens almost in a daily fashion but to remove a lens that already run away from its normal position and put a new lens in is a it's not something that we do every day huh? so it's a complex procedure it's a higher risk procedure but it's a doable procedure so the doctor who is going to do for them is definitely going to explain the type of risk involved the benefit and also uh, you know explain uh, in length about the procedure so that the patient can understand what they are going through whether they want to go through uh, or whether they do not want to go through Thank you, Doctor. I think that's all. Uh, thanks for uh, the overwhelming questions uh, from the audience. Due to the time limit, we are unable to address all the questions during the session. Thank you to our both speaker for giving us depth look into glaucoma and advanced uh, cataract surgeries. If you may need any professional consultation from the ophthalmologist for eye for any eye discomfort, uh, you may have. Uh, feel free to uh, pay visit at Tony, and the ophthalmologist would be more than happy to assist you. And uh, beside that, in conjunction with the World Glaucoma Week, Tony would like to extend their good news to everyone on their free eye screening that will be happening every Saturday of the month of March. So wait no more, call in and grab your slot. With this, uh, we have reached the end of our live talk today. Thank you once again to both our amazing speakers. And I and thank you all for staying here with us throughout the session. I hope you have all benefited as much as I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.